five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Oh, Hello. Welcome to the new one. Ni hao, jambo, marhaba. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet, Inquisition yet again. Episode two hundred and thirteen on Sunday, the second of January, twenty twenty-two. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, indeed. What a treat we've got tonight mm-hmm. um, for our first podcast of the year, because we are joined by intrepid explorer of enigmatic ancient sites brian forster how you doing brian great pleasure to be with you thanks for coming on brian yeah looking forward to this one for a bit so uh yeah, it's gonna be good no good now tell us brian um you probably have the best job in the world one of the best <laughs> jobs how on earth did you get to this point has this been like a lifelong deal for you or was there like a catalytic moment a book you read or an article or a documentary what set you off on this path oh it was a combination of things i've been fascinated by ancient places ancient mysteries since i was a kid um he used to look at national geographic when i was very young and uh the book um fingerprints of the gods by graham hancock was a great catalyst in order to uh draw me into, uh, I think he was the first one to go all over the world and see all of these mysterious places and connect, like, uh, really connect the dots together. So he was very influential um, early on. And then my first trip to England, actually, when I was 16, I got to go see Stonehenge. Nice. So, um, you know, quite a bit farther south than where you're located. But that, you know, that was amazing. There wasn't even a fence around it at, <clears throat> at the time. Yeah. So we were able to walk right up to the stones and touch them and things, which is very different from the situation today. And my first trip to Peru was about 15 years ago, where I got to see the, the megalithic structures, you know, up close and personal. And I was just, uh, I was shocked by how, um, incredibly complicated some of these megalithic sites are. So that's what really s- started me on to this path, I guess. Yeah, when you say complicated, what do you mean by how complicated they are? Well, the fact that the stones are in general megalithic, meaning very big, they interlock without any kind of uh, clay or cement or mortar. They, in, you know, they're literally interlocking with each other. And in some cases, the quarry for the stone is up to 55 kilometers away. So, <clears throat> trans, you know, cutting, trans, transporting multi-ton blocks by the Inca would have been basically impossible. So that's what uh, really draw my first um, queries and questions about who could have possibly done this kind of work. Yeah, there's a sort of uh, how did they do it sort of, because we, we were told about when we sort of read in books or watch documentaries about these certain civilizations were led to believe that they had a certain level of sophistication and technology. And when you, like you mentioned, these these massive polygonal masonry walls in Peru, and they're some of the strongest evidence for me that there's something weird going on because, I mean, they just don't look real. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think as well, it's, it's, it's the sort of the, the lack of evidence for sort of the machining and the tooling and stuff. And that's what um, kind of what the mainstream academia says is the, is the issue, isn't it? With kind of being able to evidence how they were, they were made. And so I suppose, I, so it's something I, something I wanted to ask her when we get people on like yourself is, um, how do you think they actually did it? What's your kind of ideas as to sort of like the tools and the tooling that was potentially able to do that kind of thing? Well, that's of course the most curious question because the academics still insist it was copper chisels and stone hammers and wooden wedges, which are, you know, at this point completely ridiculous. So, um, you know, been going through different theories over the course of a number of years. And honestly, I think whoever was able to do this was able to literally manipulate matter, you know, make it into a 
like a marshmallow consistency transported across the air and set the these blocks into place where they turned from a marshmallow material back into a hardened stone within maybe a, a thousandth of a second or something like that. I, I know it's, it's a very much out of the box kind of explanation, but there is no normal explanation that you can come up with that can explain this kind of stuff. It's very surreal. Mm -hmm. Well, those, those like um, giant polygonal blocks, um, was it Nick in our Discord who sent us some photos? He shared some photos yeah. with us. It just it's just got back from your neck of the woods, and he, s he shared some photos, some aerial photos of the Nazca lines, and then that famous wall he took a photo of with us. There's a little rope in front of it, mm -hmm. and when you look at those those big blocks, they almost look like a like they were a jelly, like they were yeah. a Jello mold, and you, you put one down, and then as you add weight on top of it they sort of they, they almost look like they bow out mm. yeah no exactly and uh there's a very famous green granite wall in the city of cusco that's megalithic and the the consistency of the stone is it doesn't look natural because of course quarrying from any uh, stone from any quarry you're going to get different bands of, of minerals and things in it but the whole wall is completely consistent in terms of its color and shade of green. So it does look like it's been um, chemically or physically altered in order to get it into that state. You don't see any cracks. You don't see any, uh, like I said, bands of, of uh, shades of minerals in there. So it's, again, that's why you really have to jump out of the box in order to try to explain how this possibly could have been done. And have they found the quarry for that green granite? Do they know where it came from? Yeah, actually, th that one's not too far away. It's about a mile away on top of a, of a hill. But unfortunately, during colonial Spanish times, they built churches and things on top of it. So there's no actual sign, physical sign of where the quarry is today. But that's, you know, I know a number of experts who live in Cusco. They've all told me the same thing. But the basalt quarry, which is what most, most of Cusco is made from, that quarry is 55 kilometers to the south of the city. And since you only had um, llamas and alpacas as beasts of burden, there's no way that they could have used them to transport, you know, multi-ton blocks like this. There's, lit, there's probably more than a thousand or maybe a hundred thousand tons of stone in Cusco from that quarry that was transported, you know, in pre-Inca times. I suppose as well, is that wall that you mentioned in, in Cusco, is that sort of ruins or is that sort of intact? So it was the potential for there to be actually more blocks there than are actually there now? Well, it, it shows three um, ages and levels of construction. You have the megalithic at the bottom. Right. Then above it, you have Inca repair because the Inca actually used any stone that was in the area to do the repair work, whereas the original stone wall was all from the same quarry. You, again, you can tell by the color of green. And then you have the Spanish colonial, of course, built on top of that. Mm -hmm. So does the, do the stones get smaller and softer as you go through time then? Yeah, they get smaller. They don't fit as well. Like the Inca did a relatively good repair job, but then when you get to the Spanish, the fa Spanish actually covered everything in um, in a kind of gypsum material in order, number one, to have a consistent look, and also to hide the poor craftsmanship that was underneath <laughs> it. So yeah, so I was just going to say as well, it kind of points towards like kind of think of what I've heard about in Egypt as well, in that the the kind of stonework and the masonry gets worse as you kind of move through time, essentially. Well, exactly. Like in Egypt, of course, you have the, you know, the Great Pyramids and all of that, all, you know, massive complex at Giza, which also, of course, goes underground. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, we tend to start our Egypt tours in the south because we, uh, you know, we spend four days on the Nile traveling north, and that's where you go through most of the dynastic construction, which is limestone and sandstone, which are relatively light or um, Soft. softish stone materials. And then when you get to the Giza Plateau, it's a completely different concept and approach of building. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
because <coughs> um, in the Great Pyramid, they incorporated granite, didn't they? Uh, Graham Hancock talks in his book about the the granite uh, sort of long um, rectangular blocks that were used in the relieving chambers that may, were maybe 40, 50, 60 tons a piece. Yeah, exactly. And all of that stone had to be transported from Aswan, which is at the very southern part of, of Egypt. So, of course, people are going to say they built barges and transported these giant blocks, you know, on the Nile, but they can never explain where the wood came from to build the boats to start with. So, you know, that that's always what, what they say is they say, you know, anything near the Nile, uh, it was transported, including the 720 ton Colossi of Memnon, which is one piece of stone that actually came from Cairo, because it's made of quartzite. It's not uh, not granite. Quartzite. Now that sounds like a hard stone to work with. Yeah, it's almost pure quartz. So it's seven out of ten on the hardness uh, scale. And how heavy? How heavy are the colossi? Uh, well, there's one that's still relatively intact, and it weighs 720 tons on a base, and it's one piece of stone on a base which is at least 350 tons. It's just wild, isn't it? And one wasn't enough. They yeah. had to do it twice. <laughs> you, always, yeah. you always want two, don't you? <laughs> Especially if the first one's nice. Yeah, the air and the spare. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean the same. The same goes for these giant obelisks. I mean, we're talking about Egypt now, so mm -hmm. the same goes for the big obelisks um, that were transported. I mean, the Romans, the Romans were pretty good at moving sort of big granite stuff, weren't they? But I guess yeah, but... we're talking like there's like a two and a half thousand year gap between. Well, at least. Uh, well, well, yeah. Well, uh, going off the yeah yeah, you know the um, what what would you call it the conventional mm -hmm. chronology. That there's you know roughly two and a half thousand years between the Romans and uh, the construction of the pyramids. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It, do, are you, would the the conventional Egyptologists say that the dynastic Egypts, you uh, Egyptians rather, used the same techniques as the Romans did a couple of millennia later? Would that be their explanation? Um. Yeah, more or less. I mean, when you go to the Aswan Quarry, which is where there still is a 1,200-ton obelisk that was never actually completed, they show you this 10-minute video clip, um, that, you know, that the Egyptian authorities made where they, you know, they show uh, an animation of, of how the, uh, the um, obelisks were, of course, uh, cut from the quarry, moved to the Nile, moved on to this giant barge, transported to the location where they're supposed to go to, then dragged across the sand, I guess. And then they built um, like an enclosure. They would raise the obelisk up horizontally, fill the pit with sand, and then let the sand out. And then the obelisk was supposed to gently drop down. And then they would push it up and make it, you know, stand up. Um, and of, of course, as you said, the Romans were able to move. You know, there's the famous one that's at... Um, Rome. St. Peter's um, in the Vatican. And of course, you know, one was transported to France, one was transported to uh, New York City, there's one in London called Cleopatra's Needle. There are more obelisks outside of Egypt than in Egypt <laughs> at this point. So the the uh, the video you, you just described, they didn't show the Egyptians using cranes like the Romans would have done. No, they don't. That's a very good point. Because that's a huge, it, a huge sort of advantage as far as leverage, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm pretty sure the ancient Greeks probably came up with similar sort of techniques. They were good at maths and geometry and stuff, weren't they? But mm -hmm. as far as the the Egyptian authorities, they they don't seem to Im invoke some sort of fulcrum mechanical advantage, other than just piling up loads of sand and dropping it in. <laughs> Yeah, basically, I've, I've never seen a diagram of the Egyptians using any kind of, of crane. And, of course, what kind of scale of crane would you have to have to be able to move something that was 400 or 500 or 1,000 tons? But that's, you know, that's where their whole <coughs> paradigm and story is falling apart because they come up with these 
you know, what are becoming very corny answers to complicated questions. And I guess people are still gullible enough to believe them, but anybody who has half a brain can see that we're definitely missing major parts of our history that, um, you know, we're, we, you know, Graham and I and a bunch of others are trying to unravel. Mm. I remember uh, years ago looking into what our modern cranes can do today. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can remember, the, like the heaviest modern cranes could lift was about a thousand tons, but these were shipping cranes. So they were on, the, on at ports mm -hmm. and they were static and they were yeah. just for lifting up a ship and dropping it down again. They weren't portable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they weren't portable. You know, it really does make you think, I mean, it's obviously, it was done. It's been done. Someone did it, mm. but there's just so many holes in our sort of conventional explanations. Isn't yeah, there? The methods oh, missing in the, in the, yeah, it does make me think that there is something, uh, like you mentioned about matter and how we think about matter. And I wonder about sonics. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, about sort of, uh, sonics and sacred, sacred geometry. Yeah. Yeah, frequency. Yeah, that's the word I was looking of, for, yeah. Yeah, whether they, they had something, it's almost as if they they had something not necessarily technologically advanced, that's the wrong word, but a, an advanced understanding of our reality which enabled to create these feats. Mm. What Does that sound plausible, Brian? No, definitely. The more that we're looking at this, the more it looks like frequency and vibration were involved, um, you know, Levitating or neutralizing uh, gravity had to have been involved. Um, literally moving stone through through the air, you know, it's very very plausible. Though we can't explain how it was done, but uh, it's just the logistics and all the you know the complicated aspects of trying to even replicate this today, which of course is what everybody. Um, you know, try, tries to say, like, could we do this today? Some of it, yes, some of it, no. You know, some of it is beyond our capability. And you're talking about, it, you know, the responsible cultures being of a Bronze Age level of technology. It's, you know, it's really, it's become really, the conventional stories become absolutely stupid at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's why I do what I do. That's why I make my videos is to be in the field and show people you know, that I'm actually there filming this stuff. And, um, you know, we've had thousands of people come with us on tours in Peru and Bolivia and Easter Island and Egypt and other places. And not one of them had, has been able to swallow the conventional story. They all mm. leave at the end of a tour, um, you know, with a very uh, numbed mind because of so much information their brain is trying to process. The uh Go on. No, I was just going to ask, as we were t just talking about Egypt, so I wanted to ask about, um, I'm probably going to absolutely butcher the name of this uh, uh, pyramid. Is it called Abu Rawash? And you, I kind of remember watching one of your videos about it and you kind of saying that it may have exploded or something like that. Yeah, it's a very strange place. It is called Abu Rosh or Abu Rawash. And right. the two explanations for it are either it was a pyramid that was under construction that never got finished or well actually three explanations or it exploded mm. or it had been uh, finished and then quarried but it's uh it's in a location where you need very special permission it costs i think three thousand dollars to be able to visit the site uh, most of the most curious locations we go to now are places like that that are mm. off the beaten track and uh, require a lot of paperwork and a lot of money to um to see but when you have a big tour group with you like 40 or 50 people it's quite uh you know it's, it's not that expensive mm. per person mm. why does it cost so much is it just because there's interest there and you, you see it as a you know, well the, the previous head of uh of supreme antiquities mr um zahi hawas he was responsible for covering up a lot of these ancient places because you had to go through him personally in order to be able to visit them. So the new head of the antiquities actually uh, tuned into the idea that if you charge extra money, uh, then you, you know, like two and a half or three thousand dollars for a two hour visit, then you can get uh, small groups to be able to see things that otherwise are not allowed. And so every time I go back to Egypt, there's another site that's been opened to us 
because of the special permission thing. And one thing I especially do when I'm there is uh, when I film places I've never been to before, I never put any of it on social media while I'm in Egypt. Mm. Because I, I have been told that some of the Egyptian authorities monitor my activity. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I make sure that I don't post anything major until I get back to, to Peru. And then, you know, they can't touch me. But um, yeah, there's a lot of control in Egypt over stuff like this. But the new, the new head guy is, is good uh, as compared to the people who have been uh, in charge in the past. So mm. good for us Absolutely. and for him. Yeah, um, ben, ben from Uncharted X was telling us about the labyrinth at Har Harare. Yeah. Is, uh, oh, yeah. Have you had a visit there yet? Uh, I've been there once. We're actually going back in March. So, um, you know, there's stories that there are th like 3,000 rooms underground or something like that. But unfortunately, uh, what happened is when they built the Aswan High Dam, oh, yeah. uh, the Soviets or the Russians did that, it caused a lot of... Um, flood like underground flooding so there's no way to be able to access the labyrinth if it exists there's a little pyramid that you can walk halfway down into uh, but then you're hit with a you know a giant pool of water so whether it's real or not supposedly i think it was herodotus recorded that it existed like mm -hmm. two thousand years ago yeah. Yeah. um but yeah it'll be interesting to go back there for a second time it's always um you know, most of these places I've been to many times, but places like Hawara are, are kind of off the beaten track. So it's something you, you save, um, you know, for a, a special day. Yeah. <laughs> Just going back to um, the construction methods again, um, something I wanted to ask you about was the potential for some of these stones in various places having having uh, special qualities like conductive qualities or magnetic qualities is this something you've looked into oh definitely well most of the um most of the megalithic work is out of hard stone so basalt or granite um, and they tend to be quite high in uh, quartz crystal and in the case of basalt also pretty high in iron content so of course iron is magnetic um, and then, of course, we have the very strange location of Puma Punku located in, uh, in Bolivia. And it, uh, it is comprised of two types of stone. One is red sandstone, which is neutral to magnetism. And then another material uh, stone called andesite, which is very highly magnetic. So if you take a compass to that location, uh, the compass goes, goes crazy <clears throat> on certain stones. Um, like there's no consistent aberration. It depends on which stone you're focusing on and your approach to it. So the famous H blocks are highly magnetic um, and nobody's been able to explain that. Mm. Uh, standard academics don't, don't even know that that, uh, that that anomaly exists as far as I know. So that's something that I and ancient aliens and Ben of um, Uncharted X and, and uh, people like that have been looking at. What, what are the H-blocks made out of? That's, a, that's the andesite material. Right. Did you say that was the one that's high in iron? Um, I'm not sure if... No, actually, basalt is high in iron. Oh, basalt. Right. It's very interesting. I mean, to me, those H-blocks, they look like... They almost look like they were poured or cast. Mm. To me. What's, what's yeah, your they, thinking on the, well, on the they, construction method yeah, for them? Well, they, they do look like they're cast, but the important, you know, and there are lots of theories about that they made up a big wall or something like that. <laughs> but when you go and measure them, <clears throat> each one is actually unique. They're not all of the same dimension. Wow. So e each one is a one, you know, is a one-off. Um, so that blows the theory that they, you know, that they were, uh, you know, poured or a geopolymer or something like that. So again, it, it simply adds to the mystery of the location. All oh, right. So you're saying they would have had to make a, an individual cast for each H block for them to have been poured, which just doesn't seem practical. Well, and of course, there's also the theory that the Great Pyramid also is geopolymer. In that case, you have 2.3 million <laughs> stone, stone blocks of each one's a is a unique shape. 
So you'd have to have, you know, 2.3 million forms made out of some kind of material, and plywood wasn't in existence. <laughs> it's back a lot then, of trees, so isn't it? <laughs> yeah, quite a few. <laughs> Now, I mean, the, the, I think we're, there's two different sort of um, things going on. I mean, as far as the pyramids are sort of less uh, enigmatic to me in that because cause they're the smaller blocks, maybe a, a couple of tons each, and they're a relatively softer stone mm -hmm. in limestone, mm -hmm. whereas it, the, one, the, the sites you're talking about, like Pumapunku, these are granite, these are and basalt, which are as, nearly as hard as you can get. It's, it's 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 almost like there's two different stories going on there. I don't I, I don't know. Do you think they're related? Do you think the 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 people who built Pumpunku are related to the people who built the pyramids? No, I don't think so. I think um, we're looking looking at at least three different ancient civilizations oh. because. Um, you know, Egypt, pre-dynastic Egypt, it's all very logical, it's all very left-brained, it's all very linear. Uh, then you get to Peru where it's polygonal, um, and it's more of a right-brained, playful, artistic way of, of approaching things. And then Puma Punku, you have just astonishing levels of precision, you know, almost laser-flat surfaces. So I think you're talking... Uh, of at least three different civilizations for those three locations. And then you have Easter Island where you have, of course, the giant Moai figures. Some, you know, were up to 40 feet tall. And I think that again was a different civilization again. I think you can draw some comparisons between uh, Baalbek and Lebanon and Egypt because it seems to be a, a relatively similar construction style. Like again, linear, massive scale, um, and even there's some sites in Saudi Arabia that you're allowed to visit now, which look very similar to the way that Baalbek uh, was constructed, and and to some degree Petra in Jordan. Uh, you've got to now for people who are uninitiated about Baalbek, just uh, tell people about Baalbek and the Trilithon and what's going on there. Well, Baalbek is located in what's called the Be uh, Becca Valley or Baca Valley, about three hour drive outside of uh, the capital city, Beirut. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's a surreal location. The, you know, the bus took us first up to where the quarry is, which is about a mile from the Baalbek um, site itself. And there you have, a, I think, a 1,200-ton block of stone still attached to the bedrock. And, you know, I literally said, holy F, you know, when I saw it for the first time. Because it's, you know, it's, but be, you know, seeing pictures of it is one thing, but seeing it in person, it's beyond belief. Yeah, you could ski as, down it, couldn't you? Yeah, and as you mentioned, the Trilithon, which is a, a series of 3,000-ton blocks which perfectly interlock with one another. Um, I've been there twice. And they've opened up the entire site of Baalbek now to the public. So you have massive walls of, of uh, blocks of stone weigh weighing between 400 and 800 tons, all presumably coming from this quarry. Uh, again, the conventional explanation of how this stuff was cut and transported makes no sense whatsoever. So it's another location where you see three construction styles. You have the megalithic at the bottom, then you have Roman on top, which is smaller and not as well done. And then you have a medieval fort on top of that. So you have three different levels of construction getting worse as time goes on. Mm. Now, the conventional story is that the Roman, that is that there, was only, there would only be two, I'm guessing, isn't it? Because the, the conventional archaeologists, historians say the Romans built the whole temple complex. And then the medieval yeah. layer was on top of that. Yeah, exactly. And actually, our it took us three three hours to reprogram our local guide because she kept <laughs> saying that the Romans did all of it. And you know, again, you you say, say how about this thousand ton block? How was it moved? And uh, she didn't have any explanation. But her explanation for why the Romans did it was to impress the local people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is what this is what blows my mind about Baalbek is the Romans were very pragmatic. Uh, why use a, a thousand ton block? Is ten a hundred ton blocks not hard enough? 
I just don't get this, yeah. the why that gets me. Yeah, that's the that's the, one of the most important questions. Why would you bother to go to that scale? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, just the just the, you know, the, just the logistics again of 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 cutting something that size and transporting it and setting it into place with such incredible precision. Luckily, the foundation area wasn't damaged by the Romans at all. So you can walk up very close to where this big row of 800 ton blocks are, and you can see they fit perfectly together. Like there is not an area where you can fit a piece of paper in where the joins are. So that's, you know, again, how could anyone achieve that? Um, one of the arguments used by conventional archaeology is that there was some uh, Roman column drums, I think, used underneath the trilithon. What's that? I think one of the, the conventional arguments that the Romans put the trilithon blocks in is that some um, Roman column drums were found in the wall beneath the trilithon. And I believe, doesn't Graham, Graham Hancock suggest that this is repair, possibly by um, when the, uh, not Islam, uh, Catholic Roman? Catholic Roman. No, no, after the Romans, that, that it was that it was re a repair job. Ah. Can't remember well, it definitely, yeah, it definitely looks like it was a re repair job. Um, um, yeah, that's that would be my explanation for it. Again, these sites, you know, these sites are pretty complicated. You have to have a pretty keen eye, which most people don't have, uh, you know, to look at this stuff. But when you've had, you know, several years of experience of, of going to these locations, you get more and more insight into um, how you think they were built, what you think would, would have been a later re repair work. And, um, yeah, it definitely looks like the smaller blocks were put in as an afterthought by somebody who was not the original builder. Why? Why do you think there is um, the stone left in the quarry? And I think I think isn't there a second stone been discovered in the quarry as well? Yeah, there's a bigger one. There's that they've. Um, so I think it was Russians who recently went there three years ago, and they uh, they fully excavated the stone of the pregnant woman. So now you can't climb on top. Of, you used to be able to climb up from the bottom, but now they cut they've cut all that earth out, and so it's you know it, it looms above you. And then next to it, there was just this flat surface, and some of the local archaeologists excavated one corner down to the bottom, and they estimate that's that one's one thousand six hundred tons, and there could even be bigger ones there too. Jeez, but I mean, why? why how come? Why do you think they're still in the quarry? Have, have you any hypothesis as to why that would be? What something must have happened for them to be left in the quarry? Are oh, you still there? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear Brian? Hello. Hmm. Hello. Hi, Brian. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right. <laughs> Don't know what happens. Dodgy internet, probably. Do you do you have a hypothesis or any clues, guesses as to why those stones would have been left in the quarry? Do you think what do you think might have happened? I think there was a sudden cataclysmic event that stopped activity. That's what we see in Egypt. That's what we see in Peru. Like something, like an enormous force suddenly struck all of these locations, maybe at the same time, and just simply stopped the construction. Uh, it could have been very high heat, which would have vaporized any organic life. So any, any plants or animals or people that were there would have been literally vaporized. Um, you know, we see lots of... Uh, heat damage at locations like the Colossi of Memnon and Karnak and other locations in Egypt and in Peru and Petra and Jordan. So that seems to have been what, you know, there's growing scientific evidence that that's what happened. Are they looking at the, like the exterior of the exposed bits of the stone? Um, is that showing signs of extreme heat stress? It, I don't know whether that would even show on, on material of this sort. Yeah, you see, especially on the western surfaces, you see at Petra, you see that the um, the stone has been melt, like blackened surfaces, like it's been melted. Um, at, at Karnak, it's all on the western side. 
in Peru, it's all on the western side. So it's like something, it looks like something came from the sun. Wow. So it's this kind of um, along the lines of like Robert, what Robert Shock was saying around sort of massive geostorms and things like that. Like a CME. CME. Yeah. CME. Ah, amazing. Is that your, your thinking that this is probably coronal mass ejection? Right. I think it could, it could very well be. I wrote a book called Aftershock where I look at all the all the theories of um, of ancient devastation, all all happening at the same time, all between about thirteen thousand and twelve thousand years ago, which of course Graham Hancock and uh, many others go into in, in great detail. Mm. And um, of course Robert Shock, Shock's work. Uh, you know, all the same timeline, which is really quite curious. You know, I'll just, uh, again, a little like a little bit older than the destruction of so-called Atlantis. Mm. Yeah, from Plato's account. So, I mean, how does this play in with the Younger Dryas? Do you think that it's possible for CMAs and uh, Younger Dryas impacts, or one or the other? Or what's your, your view on that? Because... There's a lot of scientific papers been written over the last two decades about potential um, comet impacts into the North American ice sheets that could have caused this civilizational reset. Um, but you seem to be swinging towards Robert Shock and coronal mass ejections. So do you think it's a bit of both? Oh, I think it was definitely both. I think there it was such a massive series of events that happened. Uh, there's also um, the theory that the emissions of energy from galactic center happened at the same time. Gamma ray and that, that, was the, that was the trigger of the whole thing, that um, um, ejection of, of, uh, from the black hole at the center of, of our galaxy happened, that that went across the galactic plane, that could have gone straight through the sun and that, that, that could have triggered the, the, the plasma ejections from the sun and then capturing comets along the path and having them, you know, whack different planets and cause a uh, change in axis of, of different planets and things like that. So I think it was a whole series of, of events that happened over the course of around a thousand years. Amazing. Not a good time <laughs> to be around. No. no. <laughs> it's a miracle uh, any of us made it. Um, how do you think yeah. um, Gebekli Tepe plays into this? Well, Gobekli Tepe is, is interesting. I've I've been there. Tech, like technically, it's not that well done. So um, you know, it's been carbon dated as the oldest known series of structures. But um, when you you know when you're pretty up close to the stones themselves, it could have been done with hand tools. You're, you're looking at a pretty large scale, like twenty ton pillars. Yeah. Uh, the quarry is supposedly right there, so it's you know it's not a big deal to move them. Um, so, you know, it's curious because it's been, uh, radiocarbon tested at that time period, you know, which is very curious, but it doesn't show the level of precision that we see in, th in these other locations we've been looking at. And, and of course, they've only supposedly excavated something like one thirtieth of it and the Turkish government don't plan to do any more mm. excavation. So, you know. I mean, it, it sort of plays into the idea that Gebekli Tepe is the restart, you know, yeah. after shortly after this cataclysmic event that maybe lasted a thousand years or so that, you know, you, you describe, you've seen these blocks up close and personal and you can compare them to Pumapunku and the Assyrian and all these other places and you think, well, this, this looks rough in comparison. <laughs> I mean, that does suggest that this is the reset rather than... Um, you know something along the you know along the lines of what you see in Egypt. Would you would you concur? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. It it looks like you know it's and the chronology seems to state that that Gobekli Tepe was probably the first gr like large complex created after this series of cataclysms. It, it, it was a like the restart of civilization again. Um, but again, you go to the museum there and it's, you know, they think hunter gatherers did all of this work. And, <laughs> yeah. 
you know, you, you'd need a very coordinated group of engineers and architects and builders to be able to do something on that scale. Um, the fact that the Turks won't let any more excavation is very suspicious. Um, but yeah, it's, it's of, of no, you know, it's impressive for me, it's impressive to see once, but it, it's not that enigmatic to me as compared to all of these other places we've been discussing. Yeah, I mean, it suggests to me that they had help from, you know, you, man, you mentioned the organization, the engineering knowledge. If you think about this is shortly after this massive cataclysm, um, there's going to be few survivors. The ones that are have, have been struggling um, for them to gather together, create a civilization, create the agriculture and therefore the surplus in food supplies to be able to have dedicated tradesmen craftsmen masonries masons and all the rest of it it does suggest to me that they had help from the outside from people from the before times the, the antediluvian <laughs> people that's what it fascinates me that that, that this could actually be real <laughs> that this is like this could be this sort of part of our story our shared history our shared mm -hmm you know where we come from and there's just so many massive holes in it if you read a, a bog standard history book that just doesn't want to entertain these questions it doesn't want to look at it because you know there's so many vested interests in in you know careers and short-term thinking and uh, all the rest of it yeah well that's you know that's why again i'm glad that there are, are a number of us now who are are creating uh, YouTube videos, you know, uh, you know, we mentioned Ben previously of Uncharted X, you know, he's, he, you know, produces brilliant docu documentary style works. He does have a background in engineering. And so, you know, he comes from a technical background. Then you have, you know, quite a few others. There's uh, Johanna James, who lives in London. She's been producing some great stuff. And uh, Bright Insight, uh, who's Jimmy, Jimmy. Corsetti. He's produced some very good things. So I'm very encouraged by the, the younger people coming up and exploring, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to influence some of these people, you know, and uh, of course, all based on older, uh, brilliant people like Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson and, you know, Robert Schock and Christopher Dunn and, you know, the list goes on and on, but it's, it's very uh, warming that um, there are more people catching on to this. Uh, they're not, buying the party line anymore more and more of, of the people pushing the old paradigm are probably retiring anyway which is a good thing so yeah. um i'm very encouraged by you know with the future and with uh what we've been able to uncover so far and what there still is to be able to show to the public in the future it's great we've maintained our sort of inquisitive nature or, or increased it almost with with the the younger generation i think that is is very positive for perhaps you know answering some of these questions in the future yeah and you know youtube provides a platform usually yeah you know I've, youtube is a great tool as long as you're not too controversial or you don't mm -hmm. this is what's so uh, dangerous about the situation we're in now with censorship online and how we have to put certain videos on other platforms because because <sighs> this is the world we live in and and politics comes into it and um we don't want to see these sorts of censorships uh escape into other fields such as alternative history you know we're already getting it for for alternative medicine alternative science and this is the danger that we have to be aware of because um what you do is great brian and for people who maybe don't have the means or they don't have the time or maybe they'll, they'll like ba baracus and they're scared of flying <laughs> you know for them to be able to go to your youtube channel and see these things up close and personal in hd and the drone footage and everything it's incredible it's an incredible utility to have yeah it is um uh I'm not concerned about being banned from YouTube, though it, it could very well happen at some point. If, mm. if it does, then that's that's the story. But um, so far, I've had you know I haven't had any strikes or anything from YouTube. So, no. uh, and I also I never get into politics. 
So I just I just look at the technical stuff that we look at and say, you know, I don't tend to theorize too much either. I just like to show what there is and say, what do you think? And <laughs> most, you know, most people think I have no idea who did that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brian, we can't let you go. We need to talk about the schools. Well, I was just about to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. We haven't even talked about elongated schools I yet. No, yeah, because you are the school guy, the elongated school guy, Brian. What's going on with these elongated schools? <laughs> well, nothing much uh, new about that because of the last two years of uh, problems we've all been having. But. Mm. Um, I would say the latest is that we know that uh, the skulls of Paracas, Peru, which is where I'm located, were not Homo sapiens sapiens. We can, you know, there a lot of medical doctors are backing that up. There are morphological differences that show that they couldn't have been uh, in Homo sapiens sapiens. So they were probably a subspecies that's proven by the uh, mitochondrial uh, maternal DNA. It looks like they migrated possibly from the Black Sea um, because yeah. only two of the skulls of the most ancient skulls that we were able to do radio or to do DNA testing were Native American in ancestry. So you're looking at you know a very complicated picture. And very recently, two of the skulls um, had their nuclear DNA tested, which is the uh, paternal side. And there was no match with anything human. Jeez. So they become, they're just becoming more and more obscure as time goes on. And um, you, yeah, when I was so, kind of watching your videos, you kind of mentioned as well, there's a difference between sort of manipulated skulls and then this other kind of maybe subset of uh, a human species or whatever. You see that, like what the differences are between the two. Yeah, the cranial volume is larger. Um, the oldest skulls appear to be natural in shape because I've actually I've seen a couple of fetuses where the skull is the size of the body. So Ooh. there's no way that that's cranial deformation. That's obviously genetics. Is that the uh, kind of mainstream view then that it is cranial manipulation, like binding? binding. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah, mainstream well, view. Yeah. Yeah, bind, binding did happen. Binding happened in almost all the cultures involved. Um, but the earliest Paracas skulls uh, from the coast of Peru here, um, they genetically were were uh, different. Um, also, the foramen magnum, which is where your spinal column enters uh, the bottom of your skull, is two and a half centimeters back from where it's supposed to be. It's not at the balance point. And so, wow. obviously, that gives evidence that the skulls were larger and elongated vertically and that uh, the foramen magnum is, is was in its position to balance where the skull is was supposed to be do you think the the later skulls may have almost have been an homage emulating so these, yeah emulating these, the gods absolutely wow. yeah be more godlike so you know that's kind of happening to this day eh? i mean is is there any evidence that the later schools were of people like of um, a higher social standing or a higher class like royalty or the analog of royalty yeah it was it was only the nobility that had this happen ah, right. too so definitely and of course like the originals were natural in shape then as their population began to dwindle they began interbreeding with normal looking people and then as the skulls began to shrink in size then that's when the when the manipulation of the binding would start to happen to maintain the look of the original people um of course no academic believes this but i think i've done more work on this than anybody on the planet so i you know it makes me a bit of an expert on it Oh, the um, theoretically could you trace a bloodline then and uh, where that d original dna was sort of maintained throughout and there would be people around today with some level of that elongated species uh, well unfortunately what happened was that the uh, you know the famous nazca lines the nazca people moved in from the north and they uh, caused genocide on the original paracas people so uh, when the nazca take over the elongated skulls dis disappear their genetic red hair of the Paracas disappears. Um, 
Red. And yeah. the Prac mm-hmm. the Prakas were actually the ones who did most of the Nazca Nazca line work anyway, not the Nazca. Oh. Red hair, that's interesting. Isn't yeah, it? I was just going to say as well, um, another thing you said in, in your video is about sort of, which is something that was completely new to me, is that you can find sort of elongated skulls all over the world. And even, I think I, I think you mentioned Akhenaten as well in Egypt. Well, he's depicted as being having an elongated skull, but mm. uh, his... His mummy's never been found, but yeah, you find you know you find elongated skull people in Melanesia. You find them uh, the west coast or western part of Africa, um, throughout Europe at Stonehenge, um, all through you know parts of South America. The Maya had uh, cranial deformation, and uh, so, so and uh, also into. I think into the United States as well to some degree. So and, would, would I be right in saying that the the ones that you find dotted around in various other places are later and therefore uh, deformation rather than the very early ones in Peru? Yeah, the only ones that appear to that could have been natural in shape are the ones in Paracas and also in the highlands of Peru as well, right. but also in the area of the Black Sea. So oh. there, there are a few pictures online. If you put it in Black Sea elongated skull, you'll see some photos, but not a lot. I don't think the Russians have done too much in terms of, of actual um, analysis of them, but you, you can find photos of them. Do you think there could be a link? Because I'm thinking the Black Sea. I mean, if we assume that the Peruvian ones emigrated from the Black Sea area, um, do you think there's any possibility of a link between the elongated skulls in the Black Sea and the Denisovans, because the Denisova cave's probably not too far from the Black Sea. I think the time frame is a lot different, though. The Denisovans died out maybe 40 or 50,000 years ago or, or more. The Paracas ones date from around 3,000 to 2,000 years ago, as far as we know. Wow, so quite recent then. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Wow, they're the, they're the ones in Peru. The natural ones, for lack of a better word, three thousand years old. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, I just wanted to bring it back to sort of um, South America. I think this is right. Is something along? It's called the the. Is it called the Capac Nian line? It sort of runs all the way up um, South America into the Americas, and that's where you find a lot of um, these elongated schools along that line. It runs up sort of like the continent, essentially. Yeah, it's actually, it's called the Path of Viracocha. Oh, and it goes from, goes from the border of Ecuador in the northwest down through the southeast. And all of the megalithic sites are located along that line. So you're talking about the Island of the Sun at Lake Titicaca. You're talking Puma Punku. You're talking Tiwanaku. You're talking Oyente Tambo and Machu Picchu and Saxe Waman. Um, and also at all of those locations, they have found elongated skulls that date from, say, around somewhere in the, in the region of around 2,000 years ago. Um, so is that just pure coincidence that they would, these civilizations would build, you know, near enough in a, in a straight line up the continent, their things? Is that like a, sort of the natural, um, I suppose, surroundings and all the rest of it that would make you do that or is there something that we're missing there of why that was done well it, it seems to be a band of energy we actually had some uh, you know Daylight. some people on on a tour with us who were very good at at dowsing energy like earth energies and um right. they that's what they said they said there was a band of, that was around 100 meters across that went went straight down through this this um this line and we we fought on the tour we followed the line and they were able to establish at each location we went to at all of these megalithic sites that there's this band that was going right through it you have something similar in england called the michael and mary lines yeah. which are energy lines too yeah. um so i suppose that potentially kind of fits in with like this idea of frequency and, and things like that as well doesn't it yeah i mean when we think of civilizations or we think about building nets to water or yeah. where the land's rich 
But what what's so en- enigmatic about a lot of these structures in South America is they're in the middle of nowhere, mm. or they're halfway up a mountain and seemingly inaccessible. Why build these structures there? Mm. And that's you know seems a good explanation to me that there's some significance to this. Yeah, that made, like that's the only place you can build structures it has of to that be there. sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's absolutely wild. I love it. Brian, we've not. Talked, mm-hmm. I think we've done an hour already, Brian. Mm-hmm. We're gonna have to let you go. I could talk to you all night, but y- you have a life. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating, though, Brian. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Absolutely, it's been an absolute treat, hasn't it? Definitely, yes. Um, is there anything you want well, to say before we pleasure. go? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, why don't you contact me in six months and and uh, we can do this again? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I'd love to. Where, where's your next big trip going to be, Brian? Your next tour? Uh, e- Egypt in March. Cool. Egypt in March. Let's get saving, boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Excellent. Well, there you are. All the links are in the in the show notes, eavesdroppers, and the the website's up on. If you're watching the video, you can see the website there, hiddeninkatours.com. Uh, stay on the line, Brian, for us for one mm-hmm. minute while we play ourselves out. And um, thanks for coming. We'll catch yeah. you on the flip side. Don't touch that dial. <laughs>